I'm Robert Scoble, and uh, I was just in New York, and we saw the Empire State Building, which has all new windows, and it saves them a lot of energy. I'm with the guy who ran the company who did that, but he's not doing that anymore. He's doing other things, and we're going to hear about uh, what he's investing in and seeing in the world. His name's Kevin Serace, and I'm so happy to have him on the show right now. <laughs> Who are you? Who am I? Well, uh, Kevin Serace, as you said, uh, and uh, CEO of AppVance, also uh, an angel investor and on six boards right now. So I really, really get to play in technology in, in some unique ways. Uh, started in Syracuse, New York, came out to the Valley in 85 and have been involved in dozens of companies at this point and uh, really, really having fun. It's a great time. It's a great time in technology. It really is. So you switched from uh, clean tech, which, well, you might as well show the uh, Empire State. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'd, 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 uh, I'd, I'd love to do that as soon as Rocky can run to the <laughs> control center and make it happen. Let me, try, let me talk caster. about uh, the, the ESB. So, so when I was at Cirrus Energy, Cirrus Materials, I was uh, fortunate enough to be the CEO for nine years, and we built a company that made technology that made buildings more energy efficient. We did 70,000 projects, but the most famous that everyone asks about is the Empire State Building. We actually created windows that were 400% more insulative than the dual pane glass that was there. And instead of throwing out the glass that was in the building, we actually removed the glass. You'll see some, some, uh, uh, some pictures in a moment. And together with a bunch of other things we did in the building, saved something like $28 million uh, of, of energy right away. Per year? And, uh, uh, no, no, that was total no. over over the life of the windows alone. And it saved $3 million a year overall and about 400000 from the windows. But they got their money back technically right away because they didn't have to bring in an extra chiller by doing these things, specifically the windows. I'll show you some, 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 some pictures here. These are pictures I took. We actually built a plant on the fifth floor of the Empire State Building took all the old glass out every night and reused the glass to build brand new windows that were 400% better um, and put them in uh, by the morning. So when you came into your office, you just had new windows. 6,514 windows, 26,000 panes of glass. We reused all the glass on site. It's, it, 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 it saved them over $410,000 a year. They got to measure it for the last three years now. The payback was three years on the whole project. 28 million over the life of the windows, 50,000 tons of CO2 the energy equivalent of $5 million of solar panels. So we also did the New York Stock Exchange. We did a lot of other buildings. But anyway, there's the story on the Empire State Building. And I, and I, I thought I'd uh, uh, bring that as a little bit of history. Um, we had a great team at that company. Uh, really, really great team. Six plants, 420 people, yeah. and 52 patents. If you ever take the tour, they make a big deal. Of the windows. The, about the windows, and, yeah. and now the Empire State Building is, is, has filed to go public. <laughs> so somewhat on the window story, I suppose. Uh, but uh, it's a great story. It was a great, great opportunity to do some amazing work with technology out of Silicon Valley and bring it to the rest of the country. So now what do you do? You're on all these boards. and. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's what's AppVance? AppVance. So AppVance is a is a rec space partner first of all, <clears throat> and that's always that shouldn't be a surprise to you. My, my goodness, <laughs> rec space has partners. Of course they do. So AppVance started as a spin out. That's out not of, why I invited you. Not, I no, I didn't know that. But it, but it, but it's nice that, that that we are since we're in rec spaces building here. So. Um, um, uh, Rackspace provides uh, hosting and, and insane, if I read all their ads, and it's really, really true, insane support to their customers, and that's what they're, what they're known for. Um, AppVance spun out of Sun Microsystems 12, 13 years ago, and um, it was a project at Sun to create an open source environment to performance test what we would have called in those days applications, today we'd say apps. Yeah. And uh, there weren't really that much in mobile and social and this and that, it was sort of web apps or web websites. Well, over the years, um, that open source project got downloaded over three million times by developers. Yeah. And so this became probably one of the most used technologies on the planet. Um, the problem with open source, there's positives and negatives with open source, right? One of the negatives with open source is if it doesn't have a really robust company supporting it that has a sort of a robust 
um, set of revenue, uh, it doesn't get supported very well. So it tends to be buggy and this and that. Now that's different than the work that Rackspace has done to support an open source stack because yeah. they've got the people, they've got the team, they can do that. Yeah. But this, you know, had a small team and there wasn't a lot of money and, 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 and this and that. So uh, about a year ago, we formed a commercial venture, acquired all the open source technology and built a big commercial platform out of it that really, um, uh, you know, took this and made it commercial quality. And uh, today the company has large customers, um, many of Rackspace's customers, plus people like Pepsi and, and Best Buy and Bell Alliant in Canada and CITI and a number of others, Deutsche Bank, et cetera. And the company's expanded to, to, to not only uh, uh, look at the performance of apps, and there's something like, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this number, but I read recently something like 100,000 new apps a week right now. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, the numbers are staggering. And Probably more this week because of iOS 7. Probably yeah. more this week. That's right. <laughs> Everybody was holding their release for iOS 7. Three again. million this week. Yeah. But, but truly, the developers, and there are so many developers. Everyone's an iPhone developer now, and everyone's a, you know, an Android developer. But the fact of the matter is they're not trained in scalability. Yeah. They're not trained in scalability at the client level or the server level. They're not trained in security. They're app developers, and they learn you know, whatever language they learn, C Sharp, Ruby on Rails, whatever it was that they're doing. They learn those tools, and they develop their apps, and they develop the server backend, and maybe that's in Java, and then they're done. And then they say, well, this should work to, I don't know, a million users. No. I, so I can honestly tell you how many, and, and I think Pepsi's a great example. Um, when they launch an app, they have more than a million users within a day. Within a day. Within a day. Yeah. More than a million users on that app within yeah. a day. By the way, uh, this is a lesson, right? How many how many users did Twitter have after being six months on the market, or five months, five oh. or six months on the market? Oh my goodness, two hundred thousand, thirteen thousand, thirteen thousand. And that's how much our expectations have changed. Because it's not just Pepsi. A lot of uh, developers come and tell me how how their first day was. You know, hundred thousand, a million, yeah. sometimes thirteen thousand after six months. And a lot of times their servers melt down that first night. You know. <clears throat> well, this is happening. Which is lame because then you lose customers who download your app, say, oh, it's not working, or can't even download your app and start complaining and start giving you one-star reviews, which retards your uh, growth over time, right? That, that, that's, exa that's exactly right. So, if you're a, if first of all, if you're a Fortune 5000, you're really hurting your brand. And if you're just a small developer, you're also hurting your brand. Now, you don't have as big of a brand to hurt and you get in there. The other thing that people think all the time is, well, I've got some load balancers and we'll just add servers. Most of the time, what we see is it's not a load balancer and adding server problem. Your code was not designed to act in a way that can support that many users. So you've yeah. got database access issues and database caching issues. You've got registration issues. Uh, you got, so you've got all these other servers that are doing other parts of the, the puzzle. So even though you've got some load balancer and you, you've tried to cache some of the database to multiple servers and all these things, um, you haven't created an environment that works well under stress and load. The other thing that happens under stress and load is that all the client side code that we're now writing. Now think about it. When, when Twitter first came out, there's probably no client side code at all. It was a website. Yeah. But today, there's a lot of client side code, both in mobile devices and on the web. And so you're writing all this JavaScript and Ajax code. And these are people who probably didn't really write true client-side code. Because in for 20 years, the only people writing client-side code were, I don't know, Microsoft and Adobe. And, you know. So Somebody, now you, some mainstream programmer, right. mainframe programmer working at a bank. Exactly. He knew what client-server really was. Right? So now you're writing client and server. Yeah. So you're not just writing a website. You've got all this client stuff. In fact, now clients go off and talk to their talk to all kinds of services. So yeah. you know the client might go and talk to Gigya directly. Your server doesn't do that. You may choose to do it from the client to do login and registration from Facebook and Twitter and things like that, or another another service like Gigya. Yeah. You you might uh, uh, choose to go out and get the weather not by going to your server and having your server get the weather from weather.com. So you may get it directly. Because you can at the client level. You can do anything you want at the client level now. You've got all that code capability. The problem is, you think you've written highly asynchronous code, and you test it with your 20 guys in the room, and you go, Look, looks pretty good. And when you get out there and stuff starts coming back to you way out of order, because some service that you're relying on, maybe 18 services you're relying on, one of them is down, dead, changed their API, or is just slow because it's loaded. Yeah. Now, now all these things come in, but they come in out of order, and one of them never comes in. And yeah. you know what happens with the client side app? It either locks up, you know, freezes, dies, and we see this happen all the time. And I, you wonder why that happened. It happens I, all the time. I got a new iPhone. I started loading all the old apps and, and a couple new ones. A couple new ones didn't work. 
I right. deleted them. And you go, well, it's exactly Because right. I don't so need this new app. I, it's like, so uh, we can jump to this. I'll just show you a few screens. And maybe I, I find that new app again, you know, because it gets popular, but probably not. It, that, that's exactly right. So, so what, we've, what we've actually created is something that's pretty simple. It has a record button. We can see record, play, and analyze. And that's basically it. So what's very cool about this is we've developed technology where one browser can actually watch what you're doing on a second browser window. Very cool. You can actually have IE and Firefox up and bring your site or app up in Firefox. I'm going to look at it that way right now. We're going to bring an HTML5 app right now. Well, we can do SOAP and REST and mobile, but just to keep it simple. Yeah. And I'm over here, and I'm going to hit the record button. And it brings this browser up. It says you want to do it in Firefox. Firefox opens and it says go. And you hit go, and you go over there, run your app, do whatever you want. Log in, do this, do that. And come over here and end. It's recorded every single step that you've done. And I don't care how complex the Ajax code is. We've recorded everything you've done in there. So you don't necessarily have to be a test coder. Mm -hmm. Now, because you logged in, you'll actually not want to use that login every time. You may want to use 50,000 other credentials that you've created. Great. We'll pull that out of a database or a CSV file, load that up. So pretty much anyone can do this. Um, it's great if you know a little test coding because there's always some things you want to do. And the net result of this, I'll, I'll, I'll go down to a few slides, is you start getting reports like this. is How many virtual users and transactions can you really handle? So in this case, it's 16, you, know, you, you peak at 16 transactions per second. And then it starts going down as you start adding users. So the transaction time goes down. And so the other thing with load and performance of these apps that you have to get into is the user experience. Yeah. Just because the server hasn't crashed doesn't mean you're in good shape. Yeah, if you're sitting there for three minutes waiting for a re response. If you're sitting there for 10 seconds these days. Yeah. I mean, people go, I don't think so. I'm good. You know, I've lost interest in your app. So yeah. you've got to look at the transactions per second and what's going on. So we give you a scalability index. We show you where the problems are. You can actually dig in here and click on any of these transactions and say what exactly failed and the red ones are failed yeah. and what didn't fail. Now, there's a bunch of companies that do stuff like this, Sosta and uh, Mercury Interactive and that. Yeah, yeah. yeah what, sure. Mer Mercury is the old, old, old stalwart from HP that, that, so what, that does what, this. How did, what, this tell is, me about the competitive landscape. And great how, great question. Uh, so, so in the competitive landscape, you've got people like Soasta, you've got people like Neolo. Those are probably the only real ones out there. And you've got some older, older products from Borland and you've got some older stuff. And then you've got the real old granddaddy, which is Mercury. HP has something like a billion dollar business in the space. So don't, you know, you never diss your competition. They're all good people. Um, you know, from what I have seen, we've got the broadest platform, probably because it was based on an open source platform for 12 years. So much got contributed to that work that in terms of depth and breadth, I don't think there's anything better. No, that doesn't mean you won't find some free tool somewhere. And look, developers love free tools. And if you want to go find some free tool somewhere, great, go do that. It probably won't find all your problems and your users are going to find your problems. But if you really want to find everything, Mercury probably isn't the answer anymore because it's a pretty old platform. The, 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 the code base of that platform is 2002, I don't know, 2003, something like that. Good for that. testing Windows apps, but not... Not, not even good for testing Windows in the Empire State Building. But <laughs> yes, good for testing Windows. So, um, and, 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 and but um, um. <laughs> but um, I had to say it, right? And then, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you just one more thing here, which is kind of interesting. So recently we launched a service, not, not yet uh, software alone, but a service, and we offer all of these services, um, that goes into security at three places. So what we found is developers don't actually know anything. You think they don't know about scalability and performance. Yeah. They certainly don't know anything about scale, uh, security. Yeah. So maybe if you're lucky, 3% of developers do some kind do, of security scan. Do you, do you help them uh, uh, see what their attack surface is and yes. what things that they should lock down? Yeah. So what yeah. we do is something very unique. So there's a company called White Hat. Of course, White Hat is a great company. There's a lot of people doing sort of white hat testing at what we call functional level. That's where you're on your pre-production server and you just run a scan and you're the only user on it and you try to break in. They're going to find things and you should fix them. But when you move that, that code to production, it's now in a new environment. It, it's, it's calling different sets of services that are now in different places than they ever were. You're exposed to the outside world in different ways than you were. Yeah. And this thing is going to get loaded in ways that you never tested over here. You didn't even try to. Yeah. And when you do that, 
it exposes. Yeah, you haven't you haven't been exposed to a botnet yet. Right? Exactly. Right. Right. Or, yeah. or 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 you know some, or some Russian fourteen year old is <laughs> running a million bots. And That's that. exactly right. And trade. Well, well. So one of the tricks now to break in and steal data is to actually um, do a denial of service attack. Uh, either legit or an illegit one. So you, you'll read it and you'll try to thwart it. But while you're off thwarting that, they're stealing data because they know at what's called stage two and stage three here. If he puts that up on the screen, you'll see sort of a, a stage two is, uh, is this area where the app is under tremendous stress and then stage three is where it's beyond stress and some service somewhere has crashed. When that happens, all your code is performing differently than you ever expected it to. We tested some banks that not only, forget denial of service, if you just had a lot of users on it, you could log in and see someone else's account. Then you think that's a problem? Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and with no due disrespect to the people they hired and what they did, no. they had just never tested in that realm. So we're the first people to offer this kind of security testing at what we call stage two and stage three where the app is so under you, stress. You have your own yeah. botnet basically and you're gonna hit, we do. Oh, hit yeah. the crap out of my code and then Oh, we will, we will, well what we tell you is um, you gotta go into maintenance mode we are going to crash your servers and it's going to be bad. So make a backup of every single server in service. We're going, to, we're going to go all the way up, take it down. We're going to find all the security holes while we're doing so. And then we're going to sit with your developers and say, okay, here's the things you need to fix. Here's what's wrong in your architecture. Here's again. Now, if you're a bank, if you're a consumer company, if you're someone storing consumer information or, or uh, um, you know, social security numbers Everybody, or HIPAA, uh, Every, I everybody mean, stores consumer information now, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, let's say, yeah, but let's say you're a healthcare company. Yeah. You yeah know, let's say you're worse. a Palo Alto Medical Foundation. You're storing, that's, you go to jail if that stuff gets out. It's yeah. not like you lose your brand. You go to jail. So you've got to be testing these things. Um, little statistic. More than 90% of break-ins now over the last year have moved to the app level. They're not at the network. You know why? We did a great job clogging up the network. It's just too hard to break into someone's network, so you don't bother. Because someone's written some app, and they know it's someone that was hired somewhere in another part of the world that wrote this app. They never did security scans. They didn't test security at, at load. And, and, it already, and it has a clear view of the database. So why not just go in through the app? I don't need to break in over here. I'll just go. They gave me a front door. And that's what people so 90% of break-ins are at the app level now, not, and this is pretty well documented. Yeah. Uh, not, uh, so, so anyway, so that's what AppVance does, and, um, and we do it both as a service as well as technology. About half of our business so is if done I'm as a service. So if I'm building an iPhone and Android app company to do, a, you know, a, I don't know, a health app, uh, how much should you budget for this to, you know? Well, it's very interesting. So, you know, people go out, dollars, you know. people go out and they'll spend, um, you know, I'll, I'll make it up, several million dollars on a whole campaign. They'll spend, you know, several hundred thousand dollars to build the app, maybe another few hundred thousand to host it over some period of time. And then they'll say, oh yeah, we should do some kind of testing, shouldn't we? Should we do security? And then they say, well, you know, we don't have anything left in the budget. Well, the truth of the matter is between security and performance testing, you probably should be budgeting 20 or 25% of your overall development budget. So if it's a $500,000 development budget, I'm making well, it up. That sounds scary. Well, well, but I mean, that, I mean, that's, you know, if it's that kind, because, yeah. so look at a major consumer brand. They'll have a $50 million program of which five goes to IT ops, of which, you know, maybe a million goes into development, of which a couple hundred thousand goes into performance and security testing, because they have to. It's a $50 million project. Now, if you're a little developer and you're coming out with a little app on the iPhone, you probably have no budget. You probably, you know, you should be doing this stuff, but you probably can't. Yeah. And you're taking a risk in your brand. But if you're a venture funded company and you raised, you know, $10 million, it's a $10 million project you've got. You know, carve out a couple hundred K out of that entire budget and make sure you do all your testing correctly. Not just your functional testing and your compatibility testing, and on Android, of course, there's, you know, there's a mess there because yeah. you you got a million combinations. And I think forty thousand combinations or it's something. Crazy, it's crazy. It's really crazy. But on iPhone, it's a little easier. So, so let's switch. Let's switch. Yeah. Because uh, now we're getting to what you do. You're on all these boards. And I am on a number of boards, so we can talk about some other fun stuff. It, well, so when you work with these companies, what what are you seeing as a trend? What 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 kinds of well, things? so here's one of the interesting trends. If you're funding a company today next round, it used to be just five or six years ago, if you could get to a million users, boy, did you get your next round. You got a million users, two million eyeballs, if, 
well, yeah. 1.98 million eyeballs because some people are right. Cyclops. But <laughs> <laughs> we got a laugh out of the back room. That's, that's actually pretty rare. <clears throat> so, um, but, but mostly, um, um, and, and today, there is no next round without 10 million users. That's sort of the, the, sort of the VC number. If yeah. you didn't get to 10 million, no, that's you what I'm your saying. app. You, 10 million since, users. Since 2006, our ex expectations have changed, right? Unbelievable when you've got you know, a billion something cell phone users and plus pad users and plus desktop users. And I, you know, I don't know, there's a several billion access points to the web, let, let alone the Internet of Things, which is a whole other space that we can yeah. talk about. Um, related to a book I hear is coming out yep. any, any day, possibly Age of tomorrow. context tomorrow. Well, tomorrow being like a week last ago. Week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when this hits. But, but nevertheless, um, a very exciting book. The Age of context is on the market. So. And it is, and I've read the book, and it's fantastic. And I, and I gave the book a great review. And it was uh, uh, not to sideline the conversation, but it, what I loved about what you did in the Age of context is it's data after data after data point. So yes, your opinions are you know throughout. But the opinions are all, and a lot of books aren't written that way. Uh, you know, they write a bunch of opinions, you go, and where's the proof? You just go proof point after proof point after proof point after proof point, and you go, even if it wasn't their opinion, I'd have to come to the same conclusion. Yeah. That's what I liked about it. You gave people ammunition that if they were going to go out and say, look, this is a whole different world, and say, no, it isn't. Yeah, it is. Let me give you 50 data. Three, we did 300 interviews, so <clears throat> it was everybody amazing. from General Motors to, uh, you know, uh, Oakley to plant you, you did a great job. I mean, it was Thank truly you. just well, fact based. Shell wrote the book, most of it, but I did a lot of the interviews. So and it was I, fantastic. We we argued, argued. You argued, and eventually it was months. a book. It's, it's great, and I really. I had to convince him that was a big deal. I, <laughs> you know, he didn't think it was. I, I like, did. Dude, I, you, you know, this was eighteen months ago. There's, there's something happening here. We got to get on top of it. Oh, well, it's it's look. Uh, we, every, everybody should read the book. That's I don't mean to plug your book, but but I really really everyone should read that book if you care about technology and you want to look ten years in the future, five years in the future, maybe one year in the future. You're you're going to see it there. So. Um, uh, yeah, we can talk about the boards uh, a little bit, but but this number is really the number this year that's permeating the valley. If you're million. not at 10 million users, uh, you know you don't go back to Andreessen for more money. It's like you didn't get to 10 million, buddy. Uh, you know what are you doing here? And maybe Mark will show up on the show and <laughs> say it's 8 million, but you know sort of the number that people are using is 10 million. Or you got to really show your ramp to 10 million. <coughs> so there's a lot of how technologies. How fast you get there matters. And, uh, how fast, how much yeah, money if you you're spend. If you're profitable, you know, if you have 10 users and they're all paying you a million dollars each, okay, let's... You know, <coughs> well, the interesting thing, I mean, with being funded today are not necessarily deals that have cash flow and have, you know, yeah. they're really, if you can get to 10 million users, we know we can get you bought by someone. And, and you're on the right scale. We'll figure out how to monetize it. So, so, so what's one of the, the hot area? Uh, it seems to be this personal, personal cloud. I mean, the contextual well, yes. piece is, uh, wow. which means medical, right? Because we're going to be wearing sensors soon. Let's we're talk be, about that. Let's talk about that. So I'm, I'm going to... My I, wife I, lost 40 pounds wearing a Fitbit, which is just a simple sensor, right? Soon we're get, my friends who have asthma have little sensors in their asthma exactly. bottles. Uh, this is a company I'm on the board of. It's called Canamer. And, yeah. and we think it's pretty breakthrough. Um, the technology has been worked on for five years. And what this is, we'll go back to material science here, um, it's a polymer that can react to any particular molecule we tune the polymer to. Okay, so think about this for a second. React meaning it expands. Yep. So let's say I wanted to react to a molecule in uh, saliva that would tell me if you're hydrated or not. Well, mm -hmm. then I could easily tell if you're hydrated simply by taking a little swab of saliva. But let's say I also wanted to know about your glucose level. Yeah. Well, then I could make a molecule, a, a, a polymer that expands to that. I can make a polymer that Does expands. Does it shrink back down after It shrinks back or? down and it's reusable. It shrinks back down in a few minutes Ooh. and it's reusable. And so you could do every five minutes a sample of your blood? And for example. Can... Well, but you don't have to do blood because we're so sensitive we can take in the parts per billion out of your saliva. Wow. Out of your saliva. So we've proven, I can't say wow. too much, but we've so you, proven. So you lick your eye, the next iPhone yes. is going to have one of these sensors and it's going to be a lickable iPhone. Or you or spit in it or whatever the case is. <laughs> and, and the sensors can ultimately get to very, very low cost. So yeah. you can imagine a day, for example, one of the things we looked at is CRP. You know what CRP is? Yeah. Okay. CRP is C-reactive protein. There's no practical test for it today. Except it turns out it does show up in saliva. And we can take... A polymer and make it expand to C reactive. What does that show you? What does CRP do? It shows you if you're going to have a heart attack in the next 24 hours. It's the precursor. 
Whoa. Wouldn't you want to know? By the way, I think I'd lick the darn thing every morning. What do I got to lose? I don't care if it's a dollar a lick. I'm licking every morning. I might do it twice a day. Now, with the new FDA rules yesterday, uh, or this week, or over the recent... That's two laughs from Rocky. That's a, a world record there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Rocky's not an not a easy guy to get no, to. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but we all want our lickable iPhone. So, so this is a core technology. At first, we proved it outside of the, you know, in a, in a handheld, separate environment. <clears throat> and you can see that we're going to move this to be part of an iPhone and part of a, an Android a device and, and these sorts of things. So what I love about saliva is there's very little you can get from your skin alone. People don't want to get blood. Yeah. They don't want to pee on things. And they don't, there's, you know, they don't want to go back there. So yeah. uh, no number two on your iPhone, right? So, no. um, so the thing is, is there's only very few places you can get liquid from your body. Saliva is the perfect one. And this is the company that's got this slew of patents around pulling data out of saliva. Wow. And so we think that saliva has the best opportunity to learn the most about yourself. Now, the FDA recently just recently had this ruling that says, okay, we're not, we, we probably won't get involved in regulating these devices that are mobile devices, that are mobile apps, uh, that are get it, giving you health information, provided they don't tell you what to do with that information. Yeah. So they can't say, go take an antibiotic. <laughs> they can't say, they, they just, here's the information, do with it what you will, share with your doctor, don't share what you're doing, whatever. But, but we can't prescribe anything for your problem. Yeah. You can decide if it says, you know, if it's flashing red, problem is CRP, warning, danger. Decide if you go to your doctor or not, but we can't suggest to you you might have a heart attack, although anyone can go on Wikipedia and find out elevated CRP is probably a good indicator that something's yeah. gone awry. And, and it's interesting because it is one of the only pre-indicators you'll have uh, wow. to, to inflammation that can cause a heart attack. So, look, you could see cholesterol, you, you could see all kinds of things coming and, and, out of this, fertility, yeah. and all kinds of very interesting stuff. So, so these sensors are very low cost. Uh, when you say low cost, are you talking $10, $100, uh, 10 cents? What, what? One could imagine a world where these sensors are pennies. 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 So that's probably five they could be, Yeah, they could It'll be. take a while. They recruit. could be disposable at that point. You where you didn't worry about cleaning and this and that. Today, they're in the many, many dollars. But you could imagine a time we but we can hundred dollars. Oh yes. Oh, absolutely. I'd pay a hundred bucks to know that I'm having a heart attack tomorrow. At, 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 yes, and and then you have to wa you have to wash the sensor so it shrinks back down, and then you do it again. Or would someone pay to know mm -hmm. what their fertility cycle is? You so, got you got women who want to know if they're fertile, and you got other women who want to know that they're not. This isn't the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you sort of want to know, right? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot that you can find the out here, method. or if you're pregnant, or yeah, the rhythm method, right? Uh, which which results in babies actually is what <laughs> results in <laughs> not a successful. Because you're probably not as good as a sensor at knowing that. No, no, no. <laughs> that right day. So, no, this this <laughs> absolutely knows. So it's really, really, really interesting when you think of virtually anything that is in your body eventually uh, does come out in saliva. Now, many of the experts said that wasn't true for many years, but lately the experts in saliva are saying, okay, when you want to get to very low parts per billion, you know, one or two or three parts per billion, if you can really sense at that level, yeah, I guess that's true. So the selectivity of this, of this poly polymer is so selective that it only expands when it sees that molecule. Wow. So very, could, uh, by the way, Viruses, could be, bacteria. Could this be used for a new kind of smell sensor? Sure. Smell is a molecule that hits something in your nose. Sure. Right? Sure. But why, what, do we want a smell sensor? I don't know. <laughs> do, do you want to know? <laughs> it's going to be oniony in a minute. I, I guess. I, I don't know. You never know, man. <laughs> I don't know. But I mean, do you want? Look, what, what anyway, a smell so sensor tell us if Rocky is in the room? Forget. For example. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Third laugh today. Maybe. <laughs> Third laugh today. Maybe. So, so that's Canamer. I do think that, um, well, I personally think the future of, of, uh, of mobile and the next generation of mobile is going to be a lot more about learning one's health. It's going to go way yeah. beyond these Fitbits and things, and it's going to be really what's going on. No, we're, saying, we, we're seeing all sorts of sensors coming along that are falling in price very, very quickly yes. and, and going, and the world's changing. And uh, now Intel has a 14 nanometer uh, fab to make these little chips that are going to be the hub that's going to hook into your phone. That's right. be very low energy. The exactly. low energy Bluetooth stuff is, that's going, right. is just about to go crazy. Exactly right. It's a great world. So you can see the world going that way. Uh, I, I, go ahead. This is just an R&D project right now? Or? It's not. It, you know, it's, 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 it's five years. The technology works and we're looking at how we best move it towards 
uh, towards an iPhone, towards a real mobile phone platform, and what things should we be sensing first? So, so here's a funny one. I mean, we've got this beautiful technology for, for originally it was designed, the first uh, uh, test was just for hydration. Could we test hydration? Turns out most humans are not hydrated well. Yeah. So, um, so we could test hydration. We do it very well. We did a three-year clinical study, the whole thing. The interesting thing is there's actually applications for cats and dogs. I mean, we never thought, because a cat and dog can't tell you they're thirsty. They often don't even know they're thirsty, and they don't go drink water when they're supposed to, especially yeah. cats. And then they die from kidney failure because they were thirsty most of their lives. Now, I don't know, you know, how, I guess you, you know, you swab the tongue of the cat and decide if the, if the cat's thirsty. Okay, he's saying, move on from the cats and dogs. Yeah, we, we gotta go. <laughs> all right, all right, what else we wanna talk about? We can talk about, uh, we can talk about anything you want. We can have you back. because We'll come back, because there's lots more to talk about. You have 12 companies, so you're on the board of, man. Uh, six companies, I'm on the board, 12 investments on top of that, so I, I do keep, it's keep, crazy. Keep, keep, keep busy. This but. is cool stuff. The Canamur, huh? Yeah. And coming into the market t next year? Yeah, probably. Well, I mean, I can, if I brought one today, I could I actually next show year, it to you working. I, I think we think in the next two years you see these increase. And the one thing I would add um, is. Well, next year's a big deal for this personal cloud. I, yes, I'm it interviewing is. Uh, the guy who runs the Consumer Electronics Show at, C at South by Southwest. Oh, yeah. Gary Shapiro. Yeah. And we're going to talk about all, all oh, these new uh, wearable computers. You know, I have a sleep sensor yeah, yeah. on. And, it's a whole new. Uh, uh, our our whole new, new iPhone has a six axis accelerometer, and you add that sensor in. And and you know where I think the battle is really going to be? It's not going to be about getting these sensors down in cost and getting. We're going we're gonna to have, in three years, more ability to sense more about our bodies than we've ever. The battle is going to come with the FDA because what's going to happen is computer technology can match what's going on far better, frankly, with all due respect to all my doctor friends who are going to yell at me for saying, far better than a doctor can within the next few years. So when we have collect all this data, um, you know, the device is going to want to tell you, well, um, actually, you know, here's what you have. You have this arrhythmia and you have this and you have that. And, if you and, and frankly, the prescription in the latest literature says take this. Well, the FDA is not going to allow that because doctors don't want it and they want a doctor in there, but it's actually going to be technically more accurate to do that. So the question will be, will you get these rogue apps from like overseas that people will download because they just want something to analyze the data for them because it'll analyze the edge cases probably better than a doctor can because how can he possibly just do it with his eyes? I mean, this is really software that can analyze the actual waveforms and the actual input and the actual molecules of everything going on. Of course the software is going to be better at it. Scares the hell out of doctors, scares the hell out of the FDA, but it's going to happen somewhere. I, Absolutely. You know, and, and so, uh, Absolutely. and Vinod's been saying this for a while, so it's going to be interesting to see where this all goes. We'll, we'll come back and talk about it more. Where do I follow you? Oh, sure. Facebook, Twitter, yeah. Google Twitter Plus. and Kevin Serace. Kevin Serace. Mm -hmm. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks. Great to see you, as always.